So I came up with this idea, pontoon karaoke. Um, so basically, it's a pretty simple setup to use like an app called Carafon or some other karaoke app. I might steal some of your ideas just so we're clear. Anything you say here may be stolen from you. <laughs> we need a non-disclosure <laughs> agreement. I signed nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing and the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your fearless host, Angie Scott. Hello and welcome. It's still summer. There's still a year full of surprises, good and bad. Lots of exciting things going on, though, and some big announcements to come, so stay tuned. So there's a really fun fishing podcast that's been around since 2011 called Fish Nerds. Perhaps you've listened to it. It's hosted by Clay Groves, and Clay is out of New Hampshire, and it's a really entertaining show. He's a fellow pontoon angler and guide, so it's really fun connecting with Clay about that. They have various correspondents on the show and special segments. One of the correspondents is crappy hippie John King. John is a huge supporter of women in fishing and the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. So I was honored when he reached out and asked if I'd like to be a special guest on the Fish Nerds podcast. That was an opportunity I just couldn't pass up. So John has since sent me a selection of his glass water angling lead-free fishing tackle crappie baits, and I can't wait to try those out here on Percy Priest Lake. Thank you, John. I will keep you posted. I had so much fun being on the Fish Nerds show that I wanted to share it with y'all here on the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast feed. There were a couple segments I cut out for sake of time, which included a really funny fish in the news segment, as well as a captain versus captain quiz between Clay and myself. So I'll put a link to the full episode in the show notes if you want to go check that out. And I highly recommend you go subscribe to the Fish Nerds podcast and add that to your podcast repertoire if you haven't already. All right. I hope you enjoy the special Fish Nerds edition of the Woman Angler and Adventurer podcast. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friend. Co-hosting with me tonight is the crappy hippie John King. Hello, John. Hey, Clay. Hey, Angie. How's it going, everybody? I, I haven't even said Angie's name yet. So, and, I, I, and our I get special to guest, <laughs> our special guest tonight is Angie Scott, host of the Women Angler and Adventure podcast. We're going to get into that in a second, but today on the show, we're going to talk about her show. We're going to talk about the rapid rise in female angling, uh, which we hope there's a rapid li- help rapid rise of. We're going to talk about pontoon boat fishing. John's got a surprise for us. And of course, we have no idea. Something else might also happen. Angie Scott, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be on your show. I've been uh, aware of your show for a number of years. Uh, so kudos to you for keeping it going for so long. Oh, yeah. I don't know how to quit. So. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, he does not know how to quit or when to quit, but yeah. we're all real happy for that. We jumped the shark in the first year, so I didn't even notice. I just kept going. <laughs> all right, so I've been, I've, been, I've been on your website doing a little tooling around and stuff, and it struck me one of the things I really like is that you've got this kind of core belief system that mm-hmm. you kind of run your show with and you kind of live your life by, and I really liked it. And it was, uh, women deserve to be better represented in the fishing and outdoor industry. I'm going to check those off. I agree with that. We are better together. Check. I guess we as a woman, is that what that means? Right. Yeah. If we yeah. all stick together rather than fight against each other, you know, well, I'm going to be there too. Yep. Uh, if she can do it, you can do it. Uh, we should enjoy the outdoors five days and work too. check, 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 yeah. check. Always leave it better than you found it. Absolutely. America is beautiful. Let's restore it. We should restore what's been lost and improve what hasn't and respect the fish totally with you on all counts. So anyway, awesome. welcome. Yeah, let's talk about uh, how you got started, Angie. 
Yeah, so uh, originally I'm from Minnesota, so just really brief background on me. Grew up fishing up there, you know, landed 10,000 lakes and all that. Uh, but I had a couple passions, and so I kind of had to decide which route I was going to take. Was I going to go into somehow in the outdoors, like maybe work for the DNR or something like that? Or was I going to go a totally different direction and follow my passion for music? And so ultimately I decided to go the music route. And so that brought me down to Nashville, Tennessee. There's some music business schools down here. And if you want to get your foot in the door in the music business, really highly competitive industry, it helps to go to a music business school, get a music business degree, uh, do some internships, that sort of thing. So that's the path I took. And I got a job in the music industry down here in Nashville right after I graduated college. Did that for a few years, um, kind of part of my passion for the music industry was songwriting. And so I, over the years would write songs off and on and I discovered this thing called podcasts. And so I was like, is there such a thing as um, songwriting podcasts? And so I kind of was listening to this one and, um, they were quitting. They, they weren't going to continue the show. So somebody else reached out to me and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to start a songwriting podcast. I know we had communicated because we were both fans of this other show. And he said, I, I can't do it by myself. I need a co-host. Would you be interested? And I was like, man, that sounds really scary. I've never I've thought of myself as having a radio voice. Uh, let's do it. <laughs> that's kind That's of my so attitude like if something yeah. scares the crap out of me you know what I at least got to try it once and see uh, I had to do it under an assumed name because I didn't want to get have any conflicts of interest with my day oh, please job tell me please tell me your assumed name <laughs> so my middle name is Marie so simple mm -hmm. enough I went by Marie my last name at the time um, my maiden name is Peralt and so I just kind of that's also a hard name to say so I went with Marie Perry it was actually called the commercial suicide songwriting podcast oh my god <laughs> <laughs> i didn't come up with that that was my co-host or my, it's a no. good name it's a, <laughs> right so on. we did that for a while um and again that just got me really in, into the podcasting thing uh got to be too much for me at one point just with um the day job and also songwriting and all of that and then i got into boating which you know we can talk about that as well um pontoons we'll talk about that later but oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> but uh so Few, fast forward a few years, um, uh, I can kind of tell that my my position at this company was going to be kind of phased out just with technology advances and things like that. And I started thinking, all right, what's, you know, and I've done it for a long time now. It was about 15, 16 years at that point. I'm like, what could I do? What am I passionate about? And at that point, it's being out on the water. It's fishing. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast about that and see if maybe I can build that up into something. And then when this position goes away, I'll already have something to fall back on. Um, so didn't quite work out that way. As you know, you don't really make bank in podcasting, at and least. People are shocked that you don't make a living <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and so my position did go away as I predicted, but um, I, you know, I had a little bit of time to focus and build. And so now I've also started a charter business uh, with my pontoon. So I have a deal. Um, that's one thing that came out of the podcast is I have a demo deal with my local dealer uh, here in, in Nash outside of Nashville, Anderson Marine and Quest Pontoons, um, who I've ha had a good relationship with for a few years. They're who I bought my first pontoon with and designed it and everything. And so they're uh, giving me a demo pontoon to to take people out on, which is well, actually a tritune. Damn um, it! <laughs> like, I, I I bought a stupid boat. I could I didn't even think to ask. Hey, can I have a boat? <laughs> yeah. So, so I get to use it for the year and then show it off and um and then it back. hopefully do it again the next year. So, but you don't have to do the maintenance. You don't have to store it. You don't. Oh my god! You're well, I keep it. I do have a slip for it here at the marina, and I I keep it up on a lift so be you know up Fancy. out of the water but uh yeah so that that's worked out really well and then 
just through kind of doing stuff with the podcast at the Nashville Boat Show this past January, I ran into Freedom Boat Club. And so over the years, I have got my captain's license um, Mm because I want to do charters the right way uh, and be properly insured and all of that. So I got my captain's license and they're looking for licensed captains to do their new member trainings. And then with COVID and the, the, the boat getting delayed due to manufacturing being shut down, I've kind of been able to fill up all this time with doing new member trainings for Freedom Boat Club. So oh, that's are, amazing. Are, yeah. That's amazing. So now, are, see, interestingly, is in New Hampshire to run a charter service in freshwater, inland waters, you don't need a captain's license. You need a commercial operator license. Okay. Which is, uh, I think, a less intense uh, program than the than the than the it's a U.S. Coast Guard captain's license you're talking about. Yeah, so it's mm-hmm. less intense than that. But you still have to have a commercial license and be insured. So like I'm a commercial operator, licensed and insured, legal to have my business. Right. But uh, I would love to get my captain's license. That's kind of like because I don't I don't let people call me captain because I haven't earned that. Earn that. It's weird to be called captain when you haven't done that. And the you know it's before. funny. That's that's one thing I found. So as part of being the kind of the head captain at freedom boat club nashville i'm trying to find other captains to help share the load so there's not a lot in our area um i found a one guy i knew through the coast guard auxiliary i volunteered for them for a couple years and um so i brought him on and he's been awesome but uh when i've been kind of researching i find out you know i'm googling and trying to find other guides and stuff in the area that advertise themselves as captains and finding out they they're not actually licensed captains yeah very few very few inland waters are licensed right they are sometimes legal to do the business but well they just have the nickname captain you know captain you know stumpy smith well maybe they spell really a real captain though right maybe it's like c-a-p-n yeah, we got a guy on our dock. Everybody calls him Captain Paul, uh, but he doesn't have his captain's license. Yeah, no, I don't. I, I always feel like if you're going to have the title, you got to earn the title. You can't just make it up. Like, right. like I like I'm Chief Executive Fishner. We made that up. I didn't earn it. Uh, so well, I've earned it now, seven years in. But I didn't right. start off with it. I, I, actually, Dave Kellum, my my original founder, started off with that, and I was Chief. Um, what did he call me? It was chief promotion officer, something like that. I don't know. Some made up crap. It's all made up. John, right. what's up? Oh, I don't know. I just, I, that was uh, awesome. I just, you know, we're real big on just taking the plunge. Um, uh, usually starts with, you know, uh, anything I'm afraid of. It starts out with here, hold my beer. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about running a fishing charter on a pontoon boat. What a terrible idea. Who does this? <laughs> I know it's like I don't understand why you wouldn't fish from a pontoon boat honestly because it's just such a nice stable platform you've got so much room um, so you can bring families out uh, mm-hmm. you're not all cramped in and getting tangled up in each other's lines you know you've got uh, you've got that bimini for shade so if it's really hot day you're not just out there in the sweltering heat um, you know they've got trolling motors so it's like i don't understand why you wouldn't it's it really is these let's roll back to that charter service so you started out this fishing charter service when um so really last year i kind of started just dabbling in it and honest quite honestly i do more recreational charters just taking people out on the lake and hanging out than i actually do fishing (laughs) which is easier Um, it's easier it's less pressure uh so really i just kind of did it here and there to get my feet wet last year so and let's let's you're in Tennessee, right? Yep. All right. So tell me in Tennessee, what's required to be a charter fishing charter captain besides the captain's license? We know that already. You got to have what is required? Is, is that required? It, even? So not on all the bodies of water. So only if it's a navigable body of water, like we've got Old Hickory uh, just north of Nashville, that's on the Cumberland River. And since on the Cumberland River, you can get to the Mississippi, you can, you know, you can basically do uh, the Great Loop um, mm-hmm. through the Cumberland River. You have to have your captain's license to do charters on that lake. I'm sure there's a lot of people that try to get away with it without sure. So captain's license, and then to be a guide, are you required to have special licensing for that? You should have a guide license. Should or have to have? Uh, well, have to have. Oh, like if, yeah. Well, okay, so it's not like Kansas where you just write, I'm a guide and Sharpie on your shirt, and <laughs> bam, you're a guide. No, that's great. So yeah. what's the process to get the license in Tennessee? 
So it's actually, from what I understand, it's fairly new so that you haven't in the past. So you don't have until, it? I don't have mine right now. No. Oh, okay. And I've Breaking not been, law. well, I've not been doing any charters <laughs> uh, because my boat uh, just got delivered uh, uh-huh. last week. So I'm actually picking up on Saturday. So nice. I had, so once before I do any actual fishing guide charters, I'll have to get that. And I think it's just an application and then a, a monetary small monetary fee that, that sounds you delightful new hampshire <laughs> and maine are the two hardest states in the country to get your guide permits in. really and both states require a uh, 100 question written test and an oral board in front of like these really macho big tough fishing game officers and they they run you through you have to be expert map and compass you have to be an expert at rescue like like search and rescue in the in the mountains oh, even wow. if you're boating And it's just incredibly difficult. So I always am a little jealous of states where it's less hoops to jump through. There's only 80 guides in the whole state of New Hampshire because most people fail the test and just say, screw it, I'm not going to bother with it. Wow. Wow, Well, well, that's good for you then, right? (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But at least you get to – now, do they send you the nifty shirt and patch or do you got to create your own, Clay? Uh, The patches I have to buy. Uh, but you can only buy them if you've got your guide license, and they're only a dollar a piece. They're cheap. Oh. So, oh, and well, a really funny kind of a side story, I've been spending forever trying to get it on my hat. See, I got my license there on my hat, and I gave it to my daughter. I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to sew this guide patch on my hat, and she, and she looks at it, and, and she goes, I'll be right back. And she grabs an iron, and it, iron, they're iron on patches. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things. Um you say you store your uh, boat at the slip at the lake, and then you're over there in the other slip, right? Because you live on a houseboat. Yeah, so I've got a 66-foot houseboat. On That's my, huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's and huge. I stay out there all the time. I do have a house, but I love staying on the houseboat as much as possible. Uh, I just love being on the water. So, um, so actually, I've got another houseboat in between, and then I've got my pontoons. So I've got the big, big one and a lift for the big one, and then my little one is next to it. So pretty convenient. You are living the dream. That, Perfect. And that's the name of my houseboat, living, oh. living the dream. Well, <laughs> appropriate, appropriate. Okay, so getting back to the the, the charters, uh, we're we're kind of dancing around the the cool stuff. Um, karaoke charters so does your boat have hookups for the lights and the mics and the the dance floor and the whole uh so, so uh, you know set up like that so i'm in nashville tennessee and it's like the number one it's like the bachelorette capital of the world i'm moving bachelorette party <laughs> and so <laughs> and so i'm like you know one of what's gonna draw those kind of people that just want to go out on the lake and have a good time and have a sober skipper to take them out and they don't have to worry about renting a pontoon having somebody to drive it and all that so i came up with this idea pontoon karaoke um so basically it's a pretty simple setup so you use like an app called carafun or some other karaoke app i might steal some of your ideas just so we're clear anything you say here may be stolen from you (laughs) we need a (laughs) non-disclosure agreement i signed nothing (laughs) (laughs) well it's your you're in a great niche there. I do the same thing that you're doing. I have I do fishing, but but actually about last summer, about half my clients just want boat rides. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've had a few clients, actually one specifically, who was about to buy a boat. Rich guy, retired, was about to buy a boat. He met me and said, why buy a boat? I can just, you're my boat. <laughs> and now I take him out every two weeks. He prepaid for the entire, like eight cruises already prepaid in advance gotcha. for all his dates. And it's just terrific. So it's a lot of money. Do you have a drill only, in your boat? Uh, I, I have one on the little one um, so that I could take that mount off and put it mounted on the bigger one if I wanted to. Kind of a little nerd since it's a demo boat. I don't really want to mess Be with safe. that too much. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, but one tricky thing you asked about, like requirements. Um, so this particular lake, it's not navigable. It's managed by the Corps of Engineers. So you do have to um, – I have to have a sublease agreement with them in order to do business on this lake. Uh, so again, I think there's a lot of people out here that get away with it with not having that. So I actually have to give the Corps of Engineers 4%. Yeah, that's of- how a national forest in New Hampshire is. If you want to guide the national forest, you pay them, I think it's 7%. Okay. Yeah, and then, but it's all it's all self-report. You have to just tell them what you made and you pay them yourself. Right, no yeah. Checking. 
Right. Yeah. And then since I've got my boat moored at this marina, I also have to pay the, I have a sublease agreement with the marina um, to do business with a boat here. So I have to pay them 10%. So that's a pretty big chunk that, that goes like, away. Yeah. It's almost 15% of yeah. your money before you even get on the water. Exactly. Yeah. Ouch. So that's, that's something to consider. So, you know, I might not do a ton this year, but, um, you know, I've got the Freedom Boat Club thing to keep me afloat as well. So, yeah, I just applied for a state grant for money's lost because of COVID-19 mm-hmm. because I am uncomfortable with guiding during this pandemic because, you know, as you know, guiding, you touch people's hands a lot, right? Right. Go mm-hmm. close to them. But on a boat ride, I could sit in my captain's seat and handle it, but I'm, I'm concerned about the, the, um, about guiding with COVID. Have you any, how do you handle this? How are you handling COVID-19? Well, so at first, you know, everybody was a little bit more cautious, um, especially when we first opened up. So we wore masks and um, even out on the boat, you know, we're, we're doing our trainings on a giant pontoon boat. So Mm -hmm. we're, we're pretty distanced anyways, and I'm just kind of talking through commands. So I kind of got to the point where I was asking the customer or the member, are you comfortable? Do you want to wear a mask? If you do, you know, I'll wear, I'll wear one, you know, and most, um, no, actually I didn't have anyone that said, I, yeah, I need, let's wear masks. So and you're outside, you know, there's, I don't know. It's a, it's a lower risk, uh, much lower risk outside than inside. And they say the virus is time spent with it inside is, is the mm-hmm. most dangerous. What I do is I wear a, a buff around mm-hmm. my neck. And if I have to get near someone, for whatever reason, I just pull it up for a second, get near them, drop it down, back to my seat, yep. by the way. So the, the just biggest try to be problem. as respectful as I can. Yeah. The biggest problem I had the first few trainings we did and we were wearing the masks was my sunglasses fogging up and I couldn't see. (laughs) I'm like, what's more dangerous, not being able to see while you're driving a boat or (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Depends on how old you are. So do you, how do you mitigate the fog? Did you put like shaving cream in them and wash them out or how do you spit in them? I'd just kind of have to move them away from my face and kind of let them air out a little bit, you know. A lot of little tricks there. Uh (laughs) So. Yeah, but it's not been it's not been too bad. And the other the other thing we do have a classroom training that we take people through. So what I did is I put it I did it, put together a PowerPoint for that, and we were doing them via Zoom, Better. which which works so well that we're continuing to do that. And now I'm just de- designing it into an online course, so that's going to save me several hours a week. So so through Airbnb's app, you can be an excursion, right? But if you have a boat and you want to be an excursion. Even though I'm legal to operate in New Hampshire, uh, Airbnb's excursion on their app will not accept my boating business unless I have a captain's license. Yep, so I'm, that, I'm eliminated from that pot of money because I don't have that license. So that's my next kind of like get that paper. That's that's what I did. That's the only way I did a few charters last year was through Airbnb. So you know. And, <laughs> and, but they take 20%. Just charge more, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, but and the problem with Airbnb that I ran into was it's per person. You can't set it up to be oh. like, um, okay, you can't set it up to be like it's six hundred dollars for a full day, uh, up to so many people. Mm-hmm. It has to be. So if one person books for like whatever, I have a four hour charter. If one person books for a hundred bucks, I still got to go out for a four hour charter just you for can't that just one tell person. me you sold out. Sorry. Mm. Gross. Yeah. So that's the problem I had with mm. working. The and did you have business. that? Did, did, did you have a one person charter? I never did. Bucks? And that would probably be rare, you know? Yeah. Cause I won't step on my boat for less than $200. Like, I just, And so that's, that's yeah. where I was at too. So uh, the John least things on the boat, then I'll go for nothing. Well, so I just want to roll back well, to make oh, sure myself and, and the audience is, is, you know, we're talking about uh freedom, boat club and this is a training course on how to become a pontoon boat operator any kind of boat so any freedom, kind of boat freedom boat club we've got wake wake surf boats ski boats um uh deck boats all all kinds of stuff so okay now is this in, just for if you want to go pro or is this something that people just take take so they they know what they're doing yeah we want everybody to be as safe as possible so we make sure every member goes through this training before they can start reserving boats well it just sounds like such a fantastic idea because uh it's kind of like the parking lot thing you know people get in parking lots and 
no stop sign, no speed limit sign. I guess I can do what I want, you know, same with boats, you know, it's like, wow, I'm, I'm in a boat. I can, yeah. you know, I can act like a jackass and it's just, you know, fine with everybody. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> you and, know. and especially now, because after COVID, I don't know if it's the same thing up there, but our on the weekends, it's a zoo out on the water here. Well, both the lakes you're talking about, an Old Hickory and Percy Priest. Percy Priest is they're right there by Nashville. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah. that's got to get busy quick. Yeah, I could imagine. Oh yeah. It's, I mean, besides yeah. the fact that you've got like a billion tourists there, Nashville's a very large city in and of itself. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, the 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 marinas have these big rental pontoons that are built like tanks and you know they got the the upper deck and the slide and you'll see just a fleet of them leaving the marina in the morning on a saturday morning you know and it's just like full of people whatever the limit is they're full to the limit of all those people heading out just to have a good time out on the water for the day so it's it's crazy <laughs> it sounds crazy. You know, and Percy Priest, I've heard of that. It, it's pretty good bass lake, isn't it? Haven't they had some serious tournaments there and so on? They have actually the second ever, I think it was the second ever Bassmaster Classic was on Percy Priest right after it got built. So that was kind of interesting. The way they did it back then, it was like a big secret. So the anglers didn't even know where they were going until they got there. And so nobody knew. And then they already had a fleet of boats that were all the same, had all the same equipment on them that they had to use. And so I saw a video uh, that was actually on Percy Priest out of my marina. Um, So that was kind of neat to see way back then. But um, uh, so there are a lot of tournaments out here, uh, you know, almost daily. And so there's a lot of pressure. And so that it's kind of a hard lake to fish because these, okay. you know, there's just so much going on all the time. Well, I think and people that, should know too, that like when you're describing a big lake, you're describing a 42 mile long lake. Like that's, we don't, I don't know if I, I where, where you are, where most people listeners are, I don't, I don't know lakes that big. Like 42 miles is and, monster. And it's 42 <laughs> miles, but it's also a river. So there's certain parts you can't really get to because it gets so shallow. Um, the Stones River is what feeds it, and it's not a very big river. And it's a, and it's a man-made lake through damming it, right? So exactly, yeah. River. Yep. And he, 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 you don't have to listen to him. He, he's always sneaking that in on us, especially me out here in Kansas. We're all artificial reservoirs clay just always got to get that in there it, um yeah that lake I you wouldn't... fish on john it, it's a, it's a fake lake isn't it it's, it's, <laughs> it, it, it hasn't been there since time immemorial like uh, our lakes here in uh, new hampshire that are so we have we have glacial beautiful lakes i'm sorry <laughs> they, they, he's, he's justifiably proud they are spectacular <laughs> so but in in your in your in percy priest lake fish listed on the website for, for the visitors information centers, striped bass. You have landlocked striped bass, which I would My love favorite. to go catch. I love them. Large mouth, small mouth, white bass, which is a uh, temperate bass, like a striper. John loves those. Cherokee bass, which I've never heard of. What's a Cherokee bass? I actually don't know. <laughs> I've not, I've not, if, if I've caught a Cherokee bass, I didn't know, know it was a Cherokee bass. I guess it's just a different strain. You know, like you got your Florida strain, so maybe uh-huh. yeah, Cherokee strain. I, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not educated on that. <laughs> uh, no, oh, actually, Cherokee bass is in the temperate bass family, like a white bass. So it's oh, okay. Oh, it is not a sunfish like a largemouth bass. Uh, so then you have sunfish, catfish, crappie, bluegill, trout. What's your favorite? So if I had my druthers, I would target striper just because mm-hmm. they're the hardest fighting, meanest fish in this lake. Are you and trolling or are you casting? So I've done it both ways. Um, so trolling would be my preference. The problem is you, if you want to really have success, you need to catch your own shad. So cast that cast net catch catch your shad there's only a couple places on this lake where you can really get into some good shad so you mm-hmm. almost need to catch it somewhere else um <laughs> you can't buy them in the bait s- stores oh no and then then you got to keep them alive so that's the next big cha- good, challenge good luck with that <laughs> yeah. so then you got to have a nice round aerated bait tank you know that they're not going to be running their noses in the corners and 
and you know all that plus it gets really hot so you got to make sure they're the right temperature so they don't get too hot and die yeah. so there's there's just so and then the, I, the guide i took out he had downriggers um and the whole deal so it's it's a lot more complicated so now i fished them just in the, certain times of year like uh coming into the spring here you you would get just these frenzies of striper and hybrids really mostly mm -hmm. um up on the surface just going crazy so you look for the birds and then you run over there really quick and you start just throwing uh, spoons or whatever and you're just catching but they're not going to be big you know typically they're just kind of a smaller size but they still fight really hard and that's fun when you can get into a good size school of those it's so. crazy fun it's crazy fun i only have the white bass equivalent to talk about uh, -huh. uh but yeah that is crazy fun i want to jump back to the shad thing because clay i uh, had a fellow on the show or, or was in fish in the news i had a little robot doohickey that you stuck down inside the bait? Oh, yeah. Uh, zom seen... Zombait. The Zombait. That's it. Yeah. I wonder if Zombait would help uh, eliminate uh, yeah. this need for these fresh live shad because I'm telling you, you know, it's like Jeff Donaldson says, you look at a shad and it, wrong and it's just going to go, <laughs> you know. Uh -huh. so. Well, Andrew, but you the... nailed it talking about the round tanks. The shad have to swim in circles or they mm -hmm. die. Right. And, and so the, the, a square tank kills shad. Clay drew that circle on the foredeck on his, his pontoon boat, and he tells me to stay inside that circle, and now I know why, so I, I don't end up nosed in the corner and yeah. uh, <laughs> banging my head on something. i got to um, keep you safe, John. Well, you're a prince, man. I appreciate it. I do. <laughs> um, Kansas has great fishing for nothing, mediocre fishing for most things, and <laughs> it kind of goes down from there. So I'm always proud to be a fisher here because it's challenging. Ah. All right. So I want to talk about women and fishing. I was doing a little bit of reading, and right now, according to Let, Let's Go Fishing, uh, which is a you know the big industry standard website, 67% uh, of anglers are male and 33% are female, but the females represent the largest growing segment of fishers. In your podcast, that's your target audience, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. So uh, we've done a lot of work with RBFF, um, Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. They've got a program called Women Making Waves, mm -hmm. where they're really trying to get, you know, more of a 50-50 kind of balance as far as men and women in the fishing industry. And the problem is, so women are you know, more women than ever are buying fishing licenses, but the problem becomes they're not uh, retaining them. So they're not buying them again the, the next year at such a good rate. So uh, the, the biggest problem that they've discovered is that women feel like they're not being represented in the fishing industry. So they don't see themselves in the catalogs and things like that. And so they're like, mm, you know, I don't really belong here or whatever. So that's one of the things I wanted to to help with my podcast. So what, what I'm doing is featuring women who are getting out there doing awesome things, you know, not even necessarily professionally, just if they're, they're, you know, passionate about the sport and they want to share about it on the show and then hopefully inspire other women to who hear that. And that they're like, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it. Like you mentioned earlier. Um, and that's just been kind of the goal of the show. So I've had a, a large variety of guests on. Um, I've even had someone from the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation talk about that whole Women Making Waves initiative. Uh, I've, I've had some famous people on, which has been really fun, like with my tie-in with the music industry. I had Terry Clark, a uh, country music singer from uh, Canada. I actually nice. interviewed her backstage at the Grand Ole Opry one night to talk about her passion for fishing. Isn't that the fun thing about podcasting? It, you got to go backstage, Grand Ole Opry. Like the same thing happened to me. I got to go to the Boston Symphony and go backstage and interview an opera singer about fishing. Nice. Like yeah. I got to go to Olay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Go on. So, but in that, in that, the funnest thing about it is like you just never know who fishes and all kinds of people are doing it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then another yeah. one I just locked in. So hopefully it happens. But Brittany Howard, lead singer from Alabama Shakes. Woo! Nice. Yeah. Yes. She's big into fly fishing. And so uh, we're supposed to do an interview with her here in the next week. So that's going to be awesome. Well, there you go. So congratulations, by the way. That's amazing that you're reaching that many people and getting – 
people on. And and these female artists are going to be excited about it because you are in a niche that no one else is really digging in on. Um, I've been for years, I, I, I have two daughters and I was taught to fish by my mother, my stepmother, taught to fillet fish by my stepmother. Um, and so for me, it's not strange or odd for women to fish in my world. That's the norm. Mm-hmm. Um, my daughter, Zoe, my oldest is my co-captain on the boat. When we go on fishing charters, I don't touch bait. I don't tie knots. I don't unhook fish. Um, it, it, whether I'm on the ice or on the boat, she just does all the work. Nice. Um, and to her, that's the normal thing for, it does not strange for her to be a girl and do that. She did tell me though, cause she is aware of her world. She said, dad, when I'm 18, I'm getting my, my uh, guide license and I'm going to be a fly fishing guide this, and I'm going to make a ton of money. <laughs> and she's not wrong. She goes, and she goes, also, I'm going to be competent. So <laughs> yeah, she is amazing. amazing. Well, and so, yeah, there are those women out there that, that, you know, I've heard of women that said, you know, I learned to fish from my grandmother and things like that. But when you do look at the industry, um, like, professional bass fishing for for instance we don't have any women that fish the bass master classic you know old boys club that one yeah Yeah. and um you know there's a couple women out there making a serious go at it which is awesome and i I hope they succeed but um one of the ladies we had on the show not too long ago her name's anastasia patterson and she's yeah trying, trying to get into the professional scene and one of the stories she told on the show was um, she just had, I don't know, I think it was when she was still in high school, but somebody just randomly said, oh, you'll never, you'll never be able to make it in professional fishing because you're a woman or whatever. Really? And, and um, that really like kind of sat it, with her, well, you know, yeah. um, well, that, even though he wasn't too. like a, a consequential person in her life, but just that comment, you know? Well, it is. Uh, and, it, and these are subtle aggressions, really. They really, they really add up over time. The strange thing for me with it is you know, I can get it like, you know, football, basketball, some sports where men are just physically, just naturally bigger than women. I can see why you might separate mm-hmm. bass fishing or fishing. The fish don't know who's holding the fishing rod. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. In, in fact, in my experience, women are better anglers than men because they pay attention. They got better. There's something else about like anyone I fish with always fishes better than I do. They're just more in touch with the world around them somehow. Um, so the fact that like, women aren't in these industries is bizarre because there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing better about a man in this. There's no stronger. There's no, it doesn't matter how strong you are. I've heard, you are. I've heard it described, you know, fishing, especially like in high school, you know, so high school fishing starting to take off because you don't have to have this physical build, you know, to, to participate in fishing like you might football or mm-hmm. basketball. So I've heard it described as the great equalizer. Um, Should be. But I think where the issue comes in, uh, and I've heard it time and time again, we've had uh, the president from the LBA, the Ladies Bass uh, Anglers Association on the show, that they do a few tournaments a year. That's kind of the ladies professional bass, you know, fishing level. But the issue is so women having children, they can't really just leave the home and travel. And, you know, it's a lot of work being away from home, these anglers that, that fish the classic, they're gone a lot. They're practicing. It's a huge time. It's a, it's a lifestyle really. And so if you want to have a family, it makes it a lot more challenging if you're a woman to be able to, to just leave the home and go do that, I guess. So that's kind of the theme I've heard uh, a lot. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Um, You know, everybody's going to have their, limitations i suppose i mean everybody wants to fish more than they can get out and do just because they got to earn a a real living somewhere Mm -hmm. um but i i want to jump back to anastasia real quick because um this is what really got me just completely stoked about your podcast because you just have these amazing people on and uh i was actually um I'd been following on on ice on Instagram for quite mm-hmm. a while. And so I'd seen, she'd been on your show and part of my research is I, I went and listened this and I got hooked. <laughs> um, I had to, um, but Anastasia is African-American, correct? Right. Yes. And uh, her mom, she's out of South Carolina, I do believe. So, Florida? 
North Carolina or South North Carolina. Carolina. Okay, one of the yeah. Carolinas. Yeah. And her mom is the sheriff in mm-hmm. the town, so th- she comes from that sort of uh, strong female model. You know, mm-hmm. you have on so many great ladies that have had some person um, try to throw a stumbling block in their path and rise above. Anyway, as soon as I got done listening, I I started following Anastasia because awesome. when I first joined fish nerds as a correspondent clay's like we're all about diversity um and frankly um i'm all for it because there are so many groups that are underrepresented um everybody wants to interview the pro bass guy everybody wants to interview the the youtuber and they all tend to be men um um i just don't want to go through the please, 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 oh, please, you know, to get somebody on the show when I can get somebody that's, you know, super stoked, super excited, and and just uh, breaking new ground. It just right. really, really is awesome. So, um, yeah. I don't have any more questions about the podcast, but people can find your – what's your website? Uh, so, really easy, just the womanangler.com is the website. Mm-hmm. And then, like, Facebook is at the woman angler. Uh, same thing on Instagram. And then, the cool thing, we've got a, a Facebook group. Um, and that's, I think, really special because that's a private group. People can ask to join, and then you can communicate with other people that listen to the show. And it's kind of more of a private setting. So, if if you have a question that you might be embarrassed to ask or whatever, it, people seem to be a little bit more comfortable in in that community. Yeah, Facebook groups uh, over I mean, we have we, we have fishers have like fourteen thousand on our page. We have a group with almost a thousand in it, and the thousand in the group are where is where the audience engagement is. That's mm-hmm. where people build the community, and it's pretty great. So congratulations, that's it's so much fun. Angie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. So that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Never trust a free line to a strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. You did it, Angie. You made a podcast. Congratulations. (laughs) Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean, casting nets, fish nerds. Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, it's a podcast, just for the halibut, fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan, eat it raw like you're in Siam, Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, Fish Nerds, it's a podcast.